uh, welcome those who are online. So those in the room, if you will, take a moment to, to welcome those who are joining us online via podcast and online. That's where you clap. There you go. That was better. If we were a boat right now, we would be in trouble. We would be we would be uh, tilting, but um, thank you for being here. So today we are continuing our series called Searching. And the reason we're doing this series is because people right now are searching. People right now are searching for something more. They're searching for something that they don't have. They're searching for fulfillment. They're searching for purpose. And maybe some of you in the room are doing the very same. We've got people from all over. We've got people from all kinds of backgrounds. We've got people who have never been to church before. We've got people that have just started coming back to church after a hiatus, we'll call it. And, and so people are searching for truth. And the problem we have today is that the truth can be found, the truth, air quotes, can be found in a lot of different places. And what social media has done, this age of social media, it has validated in people's minds that their opinions matter. Okay? But the reality is, we have one source of truth, y'all, and it is God's Word. And so last week, we, we laid the foundation of searching for truth. Last week, we laid the foundation that this is a hard issue, following God. Making the decision to invite God into your heart is a heart decision, but you also need to understand. And I believe this with all of my heart, that as a follower of Jesus, it's more important today, more important moving forward that you know why you believe what you believe. I like to call this why behind the what. And so I'm just going to say this out loud. I grew up in an environment, and I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm not trying to upset anybody. I'm just going just to tell you my perspective. This is not a casting bad light on the, any of the pastors that I grew up under or any of the pastors anywhere else. But I grew up with an emphasis on an experience without depth of knowledge. Is that okay to say it that way? And it's one thing to have an emphasis on experience because experience is part of what we get to experience in our relationship with God because there is always more that God has for us than we're experiencing right now. But you need to understand why you believe what you believe. And by the way, when I was in high school just a few years ago, when I was in high school, this was a thing. Like the thing was that you, oh, you're going off to college. You better know why you believe because you're going to get to the colleges. You're going to get to the thing. Like that was a thing then. It's, it's, it was a thing when I was the youth pastor, like just a few years ago. And it's a thing now more than ever. But listen to me. There's a reason that the fastest growing segment of higher education is private Christian universities. Like that's a thing now. There's a reason that that's the case is because... Much of our society and much of our teaching, much of our ways have, have really exited the lane of God's Word. And the part that I want to get across to you today, so I want you to hear what I'm about to say, because this really kind of lays the foundation of where we're going. What I want you to understand is what's happened over the years, because anytime man, anytime woman, you guys aren't exempt from this, anytime we humans get involved in something, we get our territory, we get our piece of the pie, and what do we want to do? We want to protect our territory, we want to protect our piece of the pie, we want to protect our kingdom. So what we do is we start with the truth, and then we start adding to the truth what we feel is convictions. And so what ends up happening over the years 
is we end up complicating following Jesus. We end up complicating what it means to follow Jesus. And Jesus made it simple on what it means to follow him. He made it very simple on what it means to get to God. But listen to me. Simple is different than easy. Those things are not the same. Simple does not mean easy. So Jesus made it very simple on how to get to God. Jesus made it very simple on how to be a follower of Jesus. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. We we talked about that in the I Am series. No one comes to the Father, God the Father, except through me. So can I make that in plain English, what, that, what we're talking about? All roads to heaven go through Jesus. There is no way to, for you to get to heaven. There's no way for you to have a relationship, which is super, super important. It's what Jesus came so that you could experience as a relationship with God the Father. So that you no longer have to go through a high priest. You no longer have to bring Mary's little lamb. You no longer have to make an animal sacrifice. Jesus did that for you. He paid the price so that you could come directly to the Father. And in essence, when you boil the message down today, that's what we're talking about. All roads go through Jesus. Jesus made it very simple. So he always gives an invitation, then he gives a challenge. The invitation is John 3.16. We all know that, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The generosity of God was in the giving of his son that whosoever, whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. So anyone is able to come to Jesus. The pastor I served under for for 19 years had a great saying. He had two that I'll use today. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. That's the first one. And the second one is the, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Anyone can come to Jesus. So Jesus made this invitation that whoever, he opened it up wide open, whoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have everlasting life. But then... He also gives a challenge because he said, if you're really going to be a follower, if you're going to follow after me, this is Jesus talking, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, we've talked about this, so we know that it's different to follow than it is to believe. I can believe in something and not change my behavior. I can believe in something and not change the direction of my life. I can believe in something and it not change who I am. But if I'm following, then I've got to keep that thing that I'm following, I've got to keep that source that I'm following in eyesight, which means I've got to remain close. That's where the relationship with God comes in. And it's going to affect the direction that I take. Because when I'm following something, I can't just go any way that I want to go. And there's a standard for us to follow, and it's in God's Word. So I think my goal today is for us to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God, understanding that God's Word is our path, God's Word is our standard. Like, we're, we're going to say those words today. We're going to talk about that today. Jesus repeatedly invited people to follow Him. Like, repeatedly invited people to follow Him. Invitation, challenge. Invitation, challenge. Invitation, it's open to anyone, but you got to deny yourself and follow. Pick up your cross. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? Like, what does it mean? We talk about it all the time. We use that term here. We, we, if you'll notice that I don't talk about believers, I talk about followers. Because a believer is different than a follower. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? So we're going to jump into this. This this idea, and I talked about it earlier, that that, um, throughout the years, we're in 2023, so 2023-ish years since Jesus was on the earth, since he was born, we have this idea of Jesus plus. And what man has done through rules and religion 
is we have complicated what it means to follow because we've added to the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came and died for you so that you can live for Him. So about 500 years ago or so, the Reformers came along and created what you and I are part of today, the Protestant religion, this Christianity. This was anyone that was separate in belief, separate in theology from the main line Roman Catholic Church at the time. And so this was, you know, the year 1500, okay? So this was a long time ago. None of y'all were there. And so the, the Roman Catholic Church at the time, they, they, they lived a very different life than they live now. They were oppressive. There they, they were some abuses that was going on. We can read history books. We can talk about that. Happy to talk more. But they had added to what it meant to follow Jesus. And so the Reformers came along and they said, wait a minute. For my 80s rock fans in here, we got any 80s rock fans in here? The last generation of great music? Uh, the last gener you know, we're not going to take it no more. We ain't going to take it, right? It was the, the first, we ain't going to take it no more song that they sang. And so they came up with a solution to follow the gospel more clearly and to make Jesus the true centerpiece of a relationship with Him. That's super important. And so before I dive into this next slide, before I dive into where we're going next, I want to say something to you. When I'm talking about religion, if you grew up the way that I grew up, in a Pentecostal environment, you figured that other people were part of religions because you were Pentecostal and it was based on experience. Right? But religion isn't just priests that wear, like, you know, robes, and it's not just about what to do at certain times during the service, and it's not having a pipe organ, and it's not about all of that stuff that you may think of when you think of religion. And maybe you're different than me. Maybe you grew up different than me. Religion is, is kind of any set of circumstances and any set of teachings that, that they say is a certain way and you have to do this to live up to the standard. Religion, I'm going off the cuff, this is dangerous. Religion is any standard that's set other than Jesus. Jesus plus. Hey, look, we know that you're saved, but in order for you really to be saved, you got to wear your hair a certain way. You can't go here. You can't do that. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. You can come to church, dress a certain way, look in a certain way, doing a thing. Okay, that's religion. So, at the time, what, what really happened is, is this teaching, the, the, the Catholic Church had this teaching that said grace plus, the Jesus plus, remember? Grace plus merit, faith plus works, Christ plus other mediators, Scripture plus tradition, glory, of, glory to God plus Mary and saints. I've struggled with putting this slide up here, and I've prayed about and talked about because what I don't want to do is I don't want to cut anybody off. I don't want anybody to think that I'm casting bad light or doing anything. I'm just telling you the story of the history of Christianity where we are what we believe in as evangelical Protestant Christians. So the Reformers came up with this. They said, wait, 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 more true to what Jesus did, more true to the gospel, more true to who he is. Salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, all to the glory of God alone. These are called the five solas. So these are five foundational statements that the Reformers came up with referring back to the gospel and how we are supposed to be saved and what the gospel means, what salvation means, what it means to have a relationship with God. 
And so what I want to do is spend the rest of our time together kind of break, not kind of, breaking these five statements out and what that means. So we have salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, all to the glory of God alone. And this is an answer to what was being taught, this, this council, the Roman Catholic Church that had come out with the statements that I read before, the plus. So let's dive into the first one, grace alone. Salvation comes from what God has done, not from anything you can do on your own. So you were not saved, Jesus did not give his life, and you were not saved because you earned it. Because you had any merit to your life and to yourself and what you could do on your own. Okay? Jesus came and he died on the cross for you. His sacrifice, his death, his resurrection is what saved you. Not anything you did. Not anything you could do. You weren't saved because you were good looking. You weren't saved because you were most athletic. You weren't saved because you were the smartest. You weren't saved because you were the coolest. You weren't saved because you could sing the best. You weren't saved because you were born into the right family and had the right last name. You weren't even saved because you pulled for the right team. The North Carolina Tar Heels, just so everybody's clear. You were saved because of God's grace alone. And God's grace, He was so generous with His grace that He sent His only begotten Son to die for you. That is why, by the way, we are to live a generous life. It's why, by the way, we're to be generosity. We're to have that generosity should define us. And it's why grace should refine us, should define us. We should be people that show grace because we have been shown grace. Grace breaks the chains that bind us. So we're clear, like, the, the, the reason that grace is so important is because grace puts God in His proper place as sovereign over all. It puts God in His place and it puts you in light of your spiritual condition without God. Your spiritual condition without God is death. You are eternally spiritually separated from God if you have sin in your life. If you're not living according to God's Word. You're separated from God. And there's, there's a very good, uh, what are those things, track that, that shows the, the gap, the divide between man and God. Right? I mean, people have misused it because they're mean about it, but the cross is what connects. The cross is the bridge. Jesus is the bridge that puts us close to God. Your death sentence because of your sin, spiritually separated for eternity from God, is not you being in the ICU. It's not you being on life support. It's not you with you know, terminal cancer. It's not you with any kind of anything that you might have a sliver of hope from recovering from. No, it's death. It's dead. It's done. It's gone. It's casting it, buried. Dirt on the top. Dead. But because of grace, you have life. And it's through grace only. And can I just tell you something? Your freedom is found in God's forgiveness because of the cross. Because of what Jesus did for you. Because Jesus died on the cross, and it's not just in His death, but in His resurrection. We're going to talk about that at Easter that you are saved. And I just need to tell you something. That I don't care if when you think about religion, you think about robes and, and pipe organs and every, whatever it is you think about. Any standard other than God's Word, that's religion, y'all. And your freedom, what Jesus gave His life for, is found in God's forgiveness. God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. So I'm going to give you some scripture. Ephesians 2.5 says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Not your merit, not anything you could do on your own. It's through grace and God's grace only. Because God loved you. He showed you grace. 
you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works, least anyone should boast. It's not anything you can do on your own. It's not because of your last name. It's not any of that. It's, it's by grace through faith in God. And it's a gift. It's a gift that Jesus gives freely, but it cost him everything. So can I just say, the gift that cost Jesus everything, you shouldn't take him back to the cross continually and say, God, I'm going to sin. I'm going to do my thing anyway. Lord, just forgive me anyway. I know, I know you died for me, but just forgive me anyway. We should live our life, and we're going to talk about it at the very end. Because we're saved, we should live our life to glorify God. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So I'm going to address that which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The works we're going to talk about next, the works that we do are a result of the relationship and salvation, not to keep it. The works that we do is the result of life change. The works that we do is the result of our purpose and our calling in life, not to keep in good standing with God. Anybody understand the difference? We're going to explain that a little further. And you were created. You're God's masterpiece. You were created just the way God created you to be. You need to understand that. So that you can walk in His purpose. It's why we're doing 21 Days of Hope. Like we're doing 21 days. This is a 21-day mission trip. And we're going to give you a way to to opt in and sign up this week. and, And Sunday, you'll be able to do it. And that's when we're going to start is next Sunday. But... You'll be able to do, and it's a 21-day missions trip so that you can go into your workplace, you can go into your neighborhood, you can go into your family, you can go into your social media feed and actually make that a positive thing, right? 21 days of hope so that you can spread the hope of Jesus, what God has done for you. You're going to be able to tell your story. You're going to be able to tell our story. It's important that we do that. God meets us where we are and uses us as new creations to accomplish His work through us. Like that's what God wants to do. Do you understand that? Like God wants to accomplish the work that He has for you. And then He has a work for you to do. You have people that you have been given influence in your family, in your work, in your neighborhood, in your friend group. You've been given influence with these people So that God can accomplish what He wants to do through you. And you do that so that I'm very clear. You do that because of what He's done for you. Listen to me. Already done for you. It's already been done. The result of the work that is done is the life that we live. Does that make sense? Faith alone. So we we just read the Scriptures. Grace through faith alone. Sinful man gets in right standing with God because we are justified by faith in Christ. For the 90s kids, when music started going downhill, I'm not talking about justified. The song. I'm talking about being justified by faith. In other words, By putting your faith in Jesus. Whosoever, what? Believes. Putting your faith in Jesus. You are made right. Only because of Jesus. So there's no works that you can do to stay in right standing. There's works you can do to get in right standing. There's no amount of money you can give. There's no mission trip you can go on. There's no amount of serving that you can do. No church attendance, perfect attendance won't get you in heaven. It's through putting your faith in Jesus and having a relationship with Him. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed by being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ to all And on all who believe. For there is no difference. You know what this is saying? 
Jew and Gentile. You and them. Jew and Gentile. There is no difference. Jesus came to die for all. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. For all have sinned. We talked about this last week. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely. Justified, there it is again. Being freely by His grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood. Like set forth the only thing that could make you right with with God is what Jesus did on the cross. Through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. God knew you were a sinner when He sent Jesus. So when He sent Jesus 2,000 years ago, He knew that you were going to be living in sin. But He sent Jesus anyway, and Jesus gave His life to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness. His righteousness overcame your sin. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You have been justified because you've put your faith in Jesus and the work has been done on the cross through resurrection. Faith in Jesus allows you to have a personal relationship with God. I'm pretty sure that everybody in the room, everybody listening to me, watching me online, listening to the podcast, I'm pretty sure that even though, even if you don't have a sweetheart, even if you don't have a honey, you've probably got a friend, probably got a friend, and your friend, you steward that relationship. And the way that you steward that relationship is you do things for your friend. If you're married, you do things for your spouse. Okay, let me just pause. Guys, I'm going to talk to us for a second. We guys play nice in the house to gain favor with our wife. I have a term for that that is not appropriate from the stage. Not a cuss word, just not going to say it from stage. We have those things. But listen to me. Ultimately, I don't cut the grass, wash the dishes, empty the dishwasher, take out the trash, clean the bathroom. That's my job. I don't do those things so that Sonia won't kick me out. She can't lift me. I'm not worried about that. I do those things because they're my responsibility, but ultimately because I love my wife. I come home with, is it a vase or a vase? I come home with a thing of flowers because I love my wife. I tell my wife I love her. Okay, partly to stay in good graces, but because I love my wife. Your personal relationship with God, listen to me, is your responsibility. You are responsible to steward that relationship with Him. And you steward that relationship by living for Him. And you live for Him by not doing things that displease Him. And you live for Him by doing things that pleases Him. Why? Because you love Him. We serve because we love Him. I serve my wife because I love her. I hope, guys, you should open the door and the car door for your significant other. Why? Because you're honoring them. You should do that to honor them because you love them, because you want to serve them. 
And if you haven't been doing that, start today. Like it's just a way of showing our there's a marriage trip free. Christ alone. There is no salvation in any other, for no other name under heaven is given among men by which we must be saved. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. All roads to heaven go through Jesus. It's Christ alone. He is the one that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. He's pulling for you. He made it possible that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you so that you have the strength to live the same power that brought Jesus out of the grave. We're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. Is the same power that lives inside of you. And here's what Jesus is. Jesus was 100% human and is 100% God. And Jesus is like no other man that walked the face of the earth before him or since or ever will because Jesus is like all of us. He was human. 100% human. Don't ask me to explain it. I can't live right, accept Jesus and get to heaven and ask him when you get there. Because Stand in line because I'm going to ask him the same thing. He's 100% human. He was tempted, he suffered, he faced hardships. And listen to me, y'all, in the year of 2023, after we've gone through COVID and everybody's mad at everybody, he was betrayed. People did him wrong. The people closest to him did him wrong. Sold him out for silver. Abandoned in him. He was like all of us because he was human, but listen to me, he was like none of us because he was God. He faced all of those circumstances and all of those things, yet he never sinned. He was perfect. He never sinned. Here it is in Hebrews chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, but was without sin. That's great in itself. Thank you, Jesus. That we have an example that we can live right, we cannot sin, we can do all the right things because we have the power within us. Thank you, Lord, for that. That's good, that's good, that's good. But it gets better. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace that we need in our time of need. That's relationship. Your relationship with Jesus not only puts you in right standing with God, but it allows you to stand in His presence. Because of what God did for you in sending Jesus. Can I take a couple of more minutes? Scripture alone. God's Word is the standard for culture, traditions, our feelings, Maybe I should have made this bold, yellow, and opinions. The problem that we've got in the Christian world today, the problem we've got in a lot of churches today, the problem we've got with a lot of pastors today, is that we are no longer making decisions based on the standard of God's Word. We're now making decisions based on the standard of what society says is acceptable. And that's just not the case. It is Scripture alone. It is the standard. It's why you should read it. It's why you should make it a priority. And listen to me, when you come to Scripture and you open God's Word, you should come to it with an open heart, an open mind, and you should be humble and teachable. I hate to tell you this, and I'm going to burst somebody's bubble that's listening to me or, or in the room today. You don't know everything. I know you think you do, but you don't. I used to think I was a pretty good athlete coming out of high school, and I was decent. Our senior year, we went to the beach, and we played beach flag touch football. We didn't have flags, so we played touch football. 
because we didn't want to like, get in the sand. And, you know, anyway, it was me and my boys. You know, we were good. We played all the time. We played on the team. We played across the street. We played together all the time. So we were good. We knew what we were doing. We, just, we, were, we were like that. So we were on the beach. We were playing football, kind of, you know, throwing football around. And this group of guys comes up and says, hey, y'all, y'all want to play? Yeah, we'll play. So we started playing their team against our team. A couple of old guys, you know, like younger than me, but old, just old guys. We thought, man, we're going to smoke these guys. They said, well, we'll y'all, y'all go ahead and y'all play first. Y'all, y'all get the ball first. <laughs> Are you sure? So we get the ball and uh, we go down and we score a touchdown. Boom. <laughs> One to nothing. We're playing to 10 because we were young and dumb. We'll play to 10. We scored one to nothing. So, you know, now we're playing man to man. I size up with a guy that looked like me. You know, he was about my size. He was about my age. I sized up with him. Oddly enough, in the story that I'm about to tell, he played wide receiver at the time because the old guy was playing quarterback. And so we lined up and I'm ready to cover him. And the next thing I know, I'm looking at sand <laughs> in the back of his head and his feet just going, I couldn't keep up with him. They beat us 10 to 1. We thought we were all that in a bag of chips. So after the game, they come up to us and said, hey guys, we just want to tell you, uh, we're with a group that's going around and we're just witnessing to, to young people and we're talking about Jesus. And uh, this is Jay Barker. He's going to be the quarterback of Alabama. He won a national championship later on, by the way. And then like all the rest of them, were for, the old guys were former football players, Division I football players, they all played Division I football. They killed us. Here's my point. What we thought we were was because of who we had been around, but when we got it measured against a different standard, we realized we wasn't that. And you can think you're right, and you can think you got the answers, and you can think you're doing the right things, but when you measure it against the standard that is God's Word, that is the only standard that matters. It doesn't matter what social media says. It doesn't matter what famous TV preacher says. If it's not lined with God's Word, then it don't matter. You should test everything. Sorry, I don't have time. Fifth statement is the glory of God alone. Listen to me. If the first statement, four statements are true, and they are, then the fifth statement can't be crossed by. It's inevitable. God's glory is the purpose you were created for. You were created to give God the glory. You were created to give God the glory through your life, listen to me, through your decisions, through your words, your actions, your habits that are in front of people and behind people. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says it, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You know what your purpose in life is? It's to glorify God. In every single thing you do, give God the glory. And that's different than lip service. That's in your actions. That's in your attitudes. It's in your ways. The words that you use around your boys. I don't know, the girls... Probably y'all too. It's spiritual maturity and purpose. It's growing in your relationship with God. God saved us for His glory. God is transforming us so that we can be able to worship and honor God for who He is. That's our purpose. That's maturity. That's growing in your relationship with God. Can I pray for us? 
I know today is a lot. I threw a lot at you. Gave you a lot of information. We'll come back to visit this. If you would like the, the Scripture verses, and, and um, I'll, I'll give that to you if you'll just message me. I'll post it on social media later. How about that? So this afternoon, I'll just post it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And God, we just take a moment right now to honor you. We take a moment right now, God, to thank you. We take a moment right now to glorify you. We take a moment right now to do inventory. To make sure that our hearts and our minds are aligned with you. And God, I just pray in the name of Jesus. God, that you would help us, Lord, to understand that our relationship with you is most important. Help us to live for you, God. If we're in this room today and, God, we've got sin in our life, I pray, God, that we pray this prayer. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, you came and died for me. Now, God, help me to live for you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name.